Have you ever wondered what military pilots know that could be helpful to you as a GA pilot? And could you benefit from a more structured approach to your pre-flight planning? Do you have plans for maintaining proficiency and upgrading your flying skills? Well, if that's you, then you're going to want to tune into this episode for our conversation with CFI and retired Air Force pilot Tom Dorrell as he talks about the processes he used to fly during his 25-year military career. Hello, my name is Max Truscott. I've been flying for 50 years. I'm the author of several books and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. And my mission is to help you become the safest possible pilot. If you're new to the show, take a moment right now and touch either the subscribe key or if you're using the Apple Podcast app, the follow key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And if you didn't hear last week's episode, boy, we got a lot of feedback about it. I recreated the cockpit voice recording of two Pilatus PC-12 pilots who crashed in North Carolina after spending most of the 27-minute flight trying to enter a flight plan and an instrument approach. And you can check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 298. Coming up in the news for the week of October 30th, 2023, a Delta Airlines first officer is indicted for threatening to shoot his captain. Vans Aircraft reports cash flow problems and a helicopter gets hit by fireworks. All this and more, and the news starts now. From KUTV.com, and this is probably one of the most shocking stories I've ever covered, a first officer has been indicted for allegedly threatening to shoot his plane's captain if the captain diverted the flight because of a passenger who needed medical attention. A grand jury in Utah issued the indictment on October 18th over an incident that occurred in August 2022, charging the pilot with interference with a flight crew, according to federal court documents. The Transportation Department's Inspector General's, or IG's, office said in an email sent Tuesday that the first officer was on the flight and was authorized to carry a gun under a program run by the TSA. Now, that would be the FFDO program, or Federal Flight Deck Officer, and that program allows flight crew members to use firearms to defend against criminal violence and air piracy. Quote, after a disagreement about a potential flight diversion due to a passenger medical event, the pilot told the captain that they would be shot multiple times if the captain diverted the flight, according to the IG's office. The IG's office said it was working with the FBI and the FAA on the investigation. The two-page indictment in federal district court in Utah says only that the co-pilot, quote, did use a dangerous weapon in assaulting and intimidating the crew member. An arraignment is scheduled for November 16th. Interference with a flight crew is a felony punishable by up to 20 years in prison. Now, the initial story did not reveal on which airline this occurred. However, the pilot's type ratings were a very good match with the Delta Airlines fleet. And a day later, Delta issued a statement saying that, quote, Delta will refrain from commenting on this matter, but will confirm that this first officer is no longer employed at Delta. The FAA also came out and said that the pilot no longer has a current FAA medical certificate. I thought you might be interested in the background of the pilot. The following comes from a variety of sources on the internet. The first officer attended Woodside High School here in the San Francisco Bay Area, graduating in 1999. He and his twin brother both earned their private by the age of 18 by training at the San Carlos Airport. The pilot completed the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps program at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, where he earned a bachelor's in aerospace studies. He was then commissioned as an Air Force officer in 2003 and logged more than 1,400 hours, including flying combat missions over Afghanistan. He left active duty and joined the Air Force Reserve nine years ago. In 2011, he earned a King Air BE-300 type rating. In 2014, he got his CFI, CFII, MEI, and also his ATP. He then got type ratings in 2015 in the 757-767, in 2017 in the DC-9, and in 2019 in the A320. He is a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Reserves. After the Air Force rejected his request for a religious exemption from a required COVID-19 vaccination, he was removed as a commander in February 2022. He immediately sued the Pentagon and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin to prevent the Air Force from disciplining him. After losing lower courts, his appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was dismissed in April 2022. Just four months later, in August 2022, the alleged incident involving threatening the airline captain occurred. From AOPA.org, Vans Aircraft reports cash crunch. With more than 11,000 kit builds completed by 2022 and hundreds more still in progress, 
Vans Aircraft delivered difficult news about the company's financial state and announced a two-week push to conduct an internal assessment that is likely to lead to price increases. Meanwhile, refunds are on hold, and many customers voiced anxiety. Company founder Dick Van Grunsven read a prepared statement in a YouTube video, along with a detailed Q&A that addressed customers that explains the current state of the company and plans to concentrate on developing a plan for next steps by mid-November. Quote, due to a number of factors, Vans is facing serious cash flow issues that must be addressed for ongoing operations. We're confident we can work through the situation, but some changes are required. Candidly, since early September, Vans has only been able to continue operating through loans of operating capital made by my wife and me. In the written Q&A, Vans detailed three primary causes of the situation, a combination of supply chain snarls and increased demand during the pandemic, which caused shipping costs to spike as Vans hired and trained new staff to work on the increased volume of orders, a multi-million dollar setback related to the use of inferior primer on parts sourced overseas, which led to corrosion forming on a large number of quick build kits that resulted in many parts being scrapped, and another issue with outsourced parts with holes that were laser cut rather than punched, with customers reporting cracks around the laser cut holes. Company tests determined the parts were usable, but many customers requested replacement of affected parts. More than 1,800 customers are currently affected by this issue, some of whom have received more than one kit. The company celebrated 50 years of making affordable, popular aircraft kits in 2022 and made a splash at EAA Air Venture last year with the introduction of the RV-15, the company's first high-wing design. From avweb.com, lightning damages helicopter tail rotor. The Canadian crew of a scheduled helicopter passenger flight is being hailed for a successful emergency landing after lightning blew half of the tail rotor off the aircraft they were flying. The helijet Sikorsky S-76 was on its way from downtown Vancouver to Victoria on Vancouver Island when it was struck. The lightning took off two of the four tail rotor blades and sent the helicopter into a dive. The aircraft dropped from 4,000 feet to 1,300 feet before the crew could arrest the descent. They were able to keep the helicopter under control and continue to their destination. It was only after landing that the pilots discovered the damaged tail rotor. The crew and passengers were checked by medics at the Victoria Heliport and no injuries were reported. From GeneralAviationNews.com, fuel exhaustion bends Piper. And this comes from an NTSB report. According to the pilot, he was in cruise flight when the Piper PA-24's engine lost full power. He told investigators that he did not have enough time to attempt a restart of the engine or to switch fuel tanks due to the low altitude of the airplane. He elected to conduct an off-field emergency landing near Sligo, Pennsylvania. During the landing, the aircraft hit a tree which resulted in substantial damage. Examination of the airplane by an FAA inspector revealed the fuel selector was positioned on the right fuel tank aux position. The right fuel tank aux fuel tank was checked and no fuel was discovered in the tank. However, about 75 gallons of fuel was drained from the remaining tanks. In a telephone interview with a pilot, he stated that he took off on the right aux tank. Probable cause, a total loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion as a result of the pilot's mismanagement of fuel. And in other news headlines, Textron Aviation reported Q3 revenue of $1.3 billion, a 14.7% increase from the same period last year. The manufacturer says the increase is a combination of higher volume and higher pricing. In Q3, Textron delivered 39 jets, on par with deliveries last year, and 38 turboprops, up five from the same period in 2022. And separately, Providence Police said two Rhode Island School of Design students are responsible for vandalizing Textron's World Headquarters building early Wednesday morning. Students targeted the business because it builds some military aircraft. And EAA announced that the application process for more than $1 million in scholarships is now open. For students over the age of 16, it pays for flight training at any flight school in the U.S. or Canada that is not affiliated with a university program. The window for applying for the funds closes on March 1, 2024. And the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, announced a three-quarter of a million dollar grant to the California Department of Public Health that will provide technical assistance to GA airports in California in disadvantaged communities to support the transition from leaded aviation gasoline to unleaded avgas. And no word on which airports may benefit from this grant. 
And China's Aero HT has released a video of its X2 eVTOL aircraft deploying its low-altitude multi-parachute system from just 50 meters or 164 feet. The chutes start grabbing air within about a second and a half of blasting out from the front of the aircraft. They're fully deployed by about a second and a half later, and they manage to catch the X2 before it flips over and holds the descent to about 11.6 miles per hour before it hits the ground. Now, what's unusual about the system is that rather than a single larger parachute, such as the ones used in Cirrus aircraft, it uses four smaller parachutes in a cluster. And I'm guessing they chose to do that so that the parachutes can fill with air more quickly than a single larger parachute, allowing the system to operate lower levels than a single parachute system. The U.S. Senate Commerce Committee will hold a hearing next week on a series of troubling close-call aviation safety incidents that raise questions about the FAA ATC operations. The committee said it will examine serious close calls across the NAS and related efforts to improve the U.S. aviation system's safety culture, processes, and technologies. The NTSB has opened seven investigations into near-miss incidents since January, including some that were potentially catastrophic. And finally, from thedrive.com, video shows Formula One TV helicopter getting hit by fireworks during U.S. Grand Prix. A fireworks show that kicked off the Austin Grand Prix last weekend didn't go as smoothly as planned as a TV camera helicopter was caught in the middle. Thankfully, disaster was avoided. In a video from Twitter, you can see the helicopter engulfed in the fireworks explosions and even hear bits of debris hit it. Once the pilot realized they were in a dangerous spot, he flew away from the fireworks quickly. The pilot avoided significant damage to the helicopter, but it could have been worse. It's definitely dangerous, a source within the helicopter community told the drive. A number of things that could go wrong. The windshields are acrylic, so a fireworks could go right through and hurt the pilot. The engine could ingest something if there's no barrier filter. Debris could get into the rotor controls. The body panels are thin aluminum or carbon fiber, so it can puncture one of those and hit a flight control or wire. The article says the video didn't seem too scary at first, thanks to the pilot's quick thinking and even quicker hands. But it points out that it could have been a disaster if the helicopter crashed as over 400,000 people attended the event. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And later, we'll talk with CFI Tom Dorrell about what GA pilots can learn from military flying processes. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let's get to the good news. This comes from Vas Rajan. He says, hey, Max, I just passed my check ride for my commercial certificate, and I did it in my SR-22 G1. Now, that would be one of the original ones, either uh, somewhere around 2000 to 2002, I believe. Anyway, he says, thanks for all you do for the GA community. The mindset that your podcast reinforces surely helped me during the oral portion of the check ride. Your podcast also helps me burn a lot of calories at the gym. I've gone ahead and sent you a contribution via PayPal as a small thank you. Well, Vaz, congratulations. Thanks so much for your donation. And I've got to figure out if there's a way to produce podcasts while at the gym. I don't think that would work, unfortunately. And earlier this week, I noticed that we are once again ranked number one in the Apple podcast chart of uh, aviation podcasts. So thanks so much for helping us do that. And you do that, by, of course, by letting others know about the show. Interestingly, I saw that we're also number one in India which is a country of about 1.4 billion people and about uh, four times larger than the United States. So hello to all of our listeners in India as well. And I want to let you know that the FAA Safety Briefing magazine is out for the November-December 2023 issue, and it focuses on winter operations. It says that articles cover some of the exciting opportunities that the winter flying season offers as well as provides a review of several important cold weather safety strategies. So I'll provide a link to that in the show notes. And one of those articles, by the way, is called Breaking the Ice. And if you're flying an aircraft with a carburetor in it, you're going to be very interested in that. It says that a recent search for carb icing related incidents since 2018 in the NTSB database rendered 192 accidents. So that's what, about 40 per year, 19 of which were fatal common theme among the accidents was the inability to recognize carb ice symptoms and the improper use of carb heat. And it mentions FAA Advisory Circular AC 20-113 that 
called Pilot Precautions and Procedures to be Taken in Preventing Aircraft Reciprocating Engine Induction System and Fuel System Icing Problems. And it mentioned uh, the different forms of carburetor ice. Now, I was not familiar with all three of these. The first one was impact ice. It forms by the impact of moist air at temperatures between 15 and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Throttle ice, which forms between 32 and 37 degrees Fahrenheit. And fuel vaporization ice that generally occurs between 40 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but which may occur at even higher temperatures when the relative humidity is more than 50%. Fuel icing usually occurs in conjunction with throttle icing and is most prevalent in engines with conventional float-type carburetors. So a key takeaway here is that carb ice doesn't just occur in freezing conditions. It can occur at temperatures well above freezing when there's visible moisture or high humidity. And I'll, of course, include a link to that article in the show notes as well. And earlier this week, I flew the localizer back course runway 12 approach into Mike Charlie Echo, that's the Merced Regional Airport, and I noticed an interesting discrepancy in the charts. Now, by the way, if you haven't flown a localizer back course before, and wouldn't be a surprise if you haven't, because there aren't that many of them here in the country, essentially it comes in from the opposite direction that the ILS would come into a runway. And you're going to have reverse sensing if you're flying with a conventional CDI, or if you happen to be flying with an HSI, It's important to remember that the front course, that is the opposite direction or the ILS direction course, must be dialed into the HSI. So, for example, we flew the localizer back course 1-2, there's an ILS to 3-0, and so we had 3-0 set on our HSI. Anyway, there was a discrepancy between the FAA terminal procedure chart, the Jeppesen charts, and the altitude shown in the Garmin Perspective Plus flight plan on the airplane's MFD. Now, there's a step-down fix at a Zipto. Now, step-down fixes are fixes that are between the final approach fix and the missed approach point. And traditionally, the rules were you couldn't have more than one step-down fix. So I've seen one chart that had two. Anyway, the profile view on the FAA charts shows a minimum altitude of 640 feet at Zipto. And coincidentally, the minimums are also 640 feet, but that's not the issue. The JEP charts in the Garmin flight plan showed a different minimum altitude for Zipto. Both of them said it should be 940 feet, so a 300-foot difference. So I submitted it to the FAA's Aeronautical Inquirer's website, asking them which of those altitudes is the correct crossing altitude for Zipto. And if you've got a question about a chart, you can also contact the FAA, and I'll include a link in our show notes for the Aeronautical Inquirer's website. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Russ Irwin. This is regarding last week's episode 298 on the fatal PC-12 crash. He says, You emphasize the importance of knowing your GPS navigator or FMS system and autopilot extremely well. I could not agree more. I believe the FAA, flight instruction community, and avionics manufacturers are failing GA pilots in this regard. I have spent too many hours in the air paying for aircraft rental and a CFII while hearing... Maybe this will do it. Or why is it doing that from CFIIs? In-flight is not a good environment for learning how to operate avionics. I hope our new FAA administrator, NAFI, and the AEA will consider these suggestions for aircraft certified for IFR operations that do not require specific type rating. For example, aircraft like the PC-12 that weigh less than 12,500 pounds. Number one, he suggests that CFI should be avionics type rated. They should have demonstrated expertise in avionics certified for IFR operations in the aircraft in which they instruct. Students should not be paying CFIIs for on-the-job avionics training. Two, the instrument rating should only be valid for IMC operations in aircraft for which the pilot has the appropriate avionics type rating. Three, as a part of the equipment certification process, in order to facilitate training and a ground check ride. Avionics manufacturers should be required to develop, distribute, and support a simulator for their avionics. I appreciate that there are many nuances and situations which would need to be considered in the rulemaking, but it's time to bring instrument certification and training into the 21st century. And I wrote back to Russ and I said, yeah, I agree, this is a huge problem, and it's only gotten worse in the last 20 years as avionics have become more complicated. The old paradigm was that CFIs would teach you what you need to know in flight, But with the advent of GPS, pilots really need to do more self-study between flights. And CFIIs should be more knowledgeable. 
I'm currently working on my helicopter IFR rating and have flown with two CFIIs, both of whom were figuring out the nuances of the avionics. Now, the problem is probably worse in helicopters as there's so little IFR flying that's done for real. For example, the Robinson helicopter is not certified for flight into IMC. About the only place where I've seen something similar to an avionics type rating is Cirrus, which has two different CSIP certifications for instructors, one for the Avidine glass cockpit and one for perspective avionics. And here's an email from listener Ron Lundquist. He wrote, Hi, Max. Love your podcast. Always learn something. Episode 296, where Jonathan Fay was lasered, really caught my ear as we had something similar happen here in Kindred, North Dakota, but it was fireworks that someone shot at an airplane. Now, that's kind of odd because we just had a story in the news about fireworks. He says, a spray plane was spraying the city for mosquitoes, and there was a gentleman that didn't agree with it. They ended up getting him on video shooting very big bottle rockets at the spray plane as it came over. Now, I could care less what someone shoots at an aircraft, a laser, fireworks, or a gun. I think they should be charged the same, a felony. The local state's attorney is sounding like they're just going to go with a misdemeanor, which is insane. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'd invite you to pay attention to this case. I've included a link here, and we'll include that link in the show notes. He says, I talked to local law enforcement who want to really go after this guy, and I've tried to talk to the state's attorney, but they won't talk to me as I'm not directly involved in the case, just a concerned citizen and pilot who is worried about what this guy will get mad at about next. Aircraft noise? And what will he use to shoot at airplanes next? As you know, Max, this could have been really bad if this aircraft had been hit. A blinded pilot, or worse, certainly could have been the outcome. Anyway, I'll try and keep you updated. Love the podcast. And aviation is a very small community, so see if you know any of these people who signed up to support the show via Patreon last week. Thanks to Jim Bassford, and thanks to these two people who both edited their pledges up to the $35 a month level, Jonathan Hall and Chase Hogg. And we had several one-time donations via PayPal, including Vaz Rajan and Michael Coggins. And we also had a one-time donation from Rob Lober from Air Tahoe. You may recall we had him on the show a while ago talking about what it's like to fly a charter aircraft. He says, I've enjoyed listening to the podcast. Please accept this donation. Hope to fly with you again sometime in the future. I've added a PC-12NG to the fleet and also getting a PC-12NGX next September. Best regards from Rob. And if you'd like to support the show, it's so easy to do. Just take a moment right now. Head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up via Patreon to make a monthly donation. Or if you'd like to make a one-time donation, go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. Coming up next, our conversation with Tom Dorrell about what GA pilots can learn from the military. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let me tell you a little about Tom Dorrell. Tom is dual rated in fixed wing and rotary aircraft. He holds an ATP and is a flight instructor. He spent 25 years in the Air Force and most of that time was spent flying rescue helicopters. He's currently a corporate pilot and a Czech airman at a Part 141 flight school. And now here's our conversation with Tom Dorrell. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Max, thanks for having me on. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate your time. Well, you've got an experience and background that many of us don't have, which is flying in the military. And I know there's a lot we can learn from the way they do aviation. Tell us about the pre-flight phase. What do pilots need to know about that? Yeah, thanks, Max. As we'll talk here, I like to, and what we were uh, taught is knowing yourself and your capabilities. You are your best uh, critic and teacher in some respects. And, you know, we all have different jobs. We're not always pilots. Some of us are training officers. Some of us are schedulers, did mobility and logistics. And what we would like to say is we'd have to put the other stuff in a box, put your additional duties away as you get ready to start the pre-mission planning. And in the Air Force, if we had the opportunity, and I flew mainly combat search and rescue, so a highly advanced version of a Black Hawk helicopter, we would sometimes, if we could, plan the missions 96 hours in advance uh, in combat. Sometimes we didn't have a lot of time to do that in training uh, back home. It was maybe 24, 48 hours, but we'd start to get initial assessment of the mission. We'd try to limit our distractions and maybe even consider transferring work duties. And 
the mantra that we would also use is, you know, plans are useless, but it's that active verb of planning. And I think it might have been Eisenhower even used that. So it's that active verb of planning that works. So remember, it's the verb, not the noun. And really developing your own process as a general aviation pilot of maybe looking at the weather, looking at the airport, looking at where you're going and what your mission needs, taking family, dogs, golf clubs. And inside of that is taking charge of your training, realizing there's initial training, getting your getting your certificate. There's continuation training, which is basically gaining proficiency skills and perfecting your craft. And then thirdly is, is uh, in that training model is the upgrade. You might go from a 172 to a 182 to something with retractable gear, something maybe with a turbocharge. But also in our pre-flight concept is that you, the individual, the pilot, is really responsible for your own training. Because after the check ride, you know, we like to say it's a license to learn, and that's when the real learning begins. There's no currency for short field takeoffs, soft field takeoffs, power off 180s, things like that. And then additionally is always look at your personal men's. Granted, we know we have the FARs and the CFRs to guide us with some things, but one thing I would like to talk to when I instructed in general aviation and even in inside the military is we had minimums that we could fly to for the military and even for general aviation, but that may, na- may not be where you are on the proficiency or the currency level. I would go over there with an instructor, maybe review them, maybe update them at some cadence with a simulator or with a safety pilot or with even an instructor. And lastly, in the pre-flight phase, I like to remind folks is that the pre-flight steps that you take in the planning and the coordination really determine your standards for flying. Because it's probably going to be a little bit late to start worrying about things once you've taken off and you're airborne and you're halfway to your location or your destination. So I think there's a lot of value and a lot of exportability and transferability that, that the GA pilot who's flying their airplane can use. Yeah, I think that's so important to really take responsibility for your own learning and training. Fortunately, most of the clients that I work with show up at the airport really prepared and they're curious. They spend a lot of time outside of the the flying, doing research and learning. I think the worst thing would be someone who just kind of shows up and says, well, teach me. <laughs> that's not going to work too well in the aviation world. If I need to motivate a, a pilot, I'll let them know that you really should know everything you possibly can about something that might kill you. That's right. You know, and, and additionally in the pre-flight phase is not only knowing yourself, but knowing your aircraft. When's the last time we would do a systems review, the last time for general aviation pods that they might have read the airplane flight manual, the pilot operating handbook, you know, what chapter was that for emergency procedures again? I, I don't remember as you flip through the book with an electrical problem at night in the weather. In the military, we would always say with emergency procedures, we practice them at a regular cadence and pacing, and I'll discuss that here shortly. But we use the acronym MATTER, M-A-T-R, where we maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, take appropriate action, refer to checklists. And just like in corporate aviation, what I do now is we have memory items. There may be some in the military and the Air Force, we call it the bold face. I believe the Army calls it the underlying items, basically the immediate actions that you need to do. But one thing we did in the military is the first of every month, We would write out our, we called it boldface, our emergency actions. And it was a closed book test and it had to be verbatim. We did on pen and paper when I was younger and now it's all on a computer. So it's a little bit different. You have to get the spaces just right or the computer kicks it back. But we would fill that out and then we would turn that in and it would be graded. And if we didn't pass, we didn't go fly that day. That was a great motivator for the students to know their material, right? Know themselves first, know their aircraft. And when those two come together, you have a pretty powerful team. And then additionally, on the first of the month, we would do that bold face. But then every day before we would go fly, and that wasn't every day in the military. It was depending on your qualifications, max two, three, sometimes four days or nights a week. We would do a massive briefing, and that's weather, notams, a little intelligence update of what's going on around, around the world. And then we do the emergency procedure of the day. And so we'd pick, they'd have all the emergency procedures listed from our specific books and rules and regulations. And we'd have a scenario, hey, you're flying along and you get this caution light and 
what would you do? And since I flew a crew aircraft, usually it was the aircraft commander or the pilot in command who would start off going, okay, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing the hydraulic problem. What else do I see? And then some, some units got actually pretty creative as they'd have the PowerPoint and they'd go through the different, what they see, what they feel, what they smell in the aircraft. And they'd work the problem to a logical conclusion. And I think for the general aviation pilot, I think it is very powerful because you can go through your specific chapters in your POH or your operating manual, and you can pull out 25, 30 different emergency procedures in no specific order about engine fire during startup, electrical fire, caps deployment if you're in the Cirrus, which is Cirrus space, which I know you are. I've flown those as well. We would talk a lot about that when I flew them at the Air Force Academy. No radio situations. And, and you would do this every day. So if you're flying on the 5th, you'd go to one that would correspond to the 5th of the month and you just practice. And it kept us really sharp and focused because sometimes when we were flying in the helicopter, there wasn't a lot of time to have a lengthy discussion about the emergencies. Sometimes in general aviation, there may be emergencies where it may not represent itself exactly how the book tells you. Uh, so that's where you have to know the systems knowledge but it kept us sharp, kept us practice, kept us involved in our flying. And I think for general aviation, they can build their own, their own emergency procedure of the day and just sit around and review that with maybe a flying club, a CFI. If your spouse flies with you, it might be a great opportunity for them to get involved of, hey, can you go find the checklist and pull out, let's walk through the alternator failure or emergency descent or something like that. And realizing that Sometimes having help to walk through those emergency procedures will help. So that's just another aspect of the pre-flight phase. Yeah, I think that's really a powerful concept to have uh, basically the emergency procedure of the day. If I compare what I've heard about military flying with general aviation uh, flying, this is probably one of the biggest differences. I don't see as much emphasis being placed on emergencies. I mentioned before on the show that there's at least one airline that requires the crew that every time they taxi out to the runway, they have to review at least one emergency. Now, that probably works well when you've got a crew. But a lot of folks are just flying by themselves. Probably not a good idea to be reviewing an emergency when you're taxiing by yourself because you should focus on taxiing when the aircraft is in motion and not be doing any other kind of thing. But I think anytime people are in flight, if they've got the autopilot on and they've got a ways to go, I think that's just a perfect opportunity to start reviewing some emergencies. And I think the other thing is just to figure out how best to find a particular emergency in your checklist. I've noted that in the Cirrus that we've got those uh, procedures available both in a printed form and in an electronic form. And to me, uh, for that particular section of the checklist, it is much faster to find an emergency in the electronic checklist. And I've watched as people kind of page through and page through the, the paper version. So I just, I think we should encourage everyone to think about where do I go to get to my emergencies as quickly as possible and when and how will I review them? No, I, I agree. I'm a, I'm a big believer. And what we would say in the military is you may not necessarily rise to the occasion. You're probably going to fall to the level of your training and being familiar with your AFM, POH, both digital and paper is a good thing because, you, you know, and there's been decades of accident reviews about temporal distortion, time compression, and how things either slow down or speed up. And having that familiarity of knowing yourself, like I said in the beginning, but also knowing your aircraft and knowing the paperwork to go with that aircraft is, is critical. Yeah, and I think the other focus should be on uh, memory items. Uh, again, I think a lot of people in, in GA are kind of focused on, well, let's go to the checklist and find the, the eight things or however many things we need to do. But for some of those emergencies, it really makes sense to memorize the first few critical steps. So, for example, if I were to have an engine failure, wow, I know exactly which things I'm going to be touching and turning and so on in the aircraft before I even get to that checklist. Right. And, and it just gets you going in the right direction. Same thing like if, if folks fly multi-engine, you know the famous drill that you're going to have to do. Uh, and if you go from airplane to airplane, sometimes manufacturers put the throttles and the props in different locations. So if you fly multiple airplanes, knowing sure what you're touching and what that action is going to do. But if you are not proficient on your knowledge, uh, it could have a, a detrimental impact. 
Yes, and in the serious world, we're always encouraging people to do uh, pre-takeoff briefings, talk about what you're going to do if there are any issues on the runway, what happens if the engine fails when you're below a certain altitude, and so on. At any time I'm flying a twin, boy, I am thinking about each of those steps before I take off, every time before I take off in terms of, you know, what are the, the, the five or six things that I'm going to do if that engine happens to quit when we first take off. Yeah, I fly corporately now and we always have an SOP that we follow. We always do a pre-departure brief and we have certain duties and actions, who's doing what, who's in charge of what. And it's always good. I'd rather be 30 seconds late for an appointment or the customer and make sure that we get the briefing. We've set the conditions. We set the right tenor and tone inside the cockpit because when there's an emergency, there's really little time, if so, no time to go back and reset those conditions to get the emergency procedure correctly contained and the aircraft safely back on the ground. I think you raise a really good point, which is that I think sometimes people think that it makes sense to skip a few steps in the pre-takeoff process because they're running late and this will help move things along. I read recently about a crew that had an accident in which they spent most of the time trying to get the flight plan in before they crashed. And it was clear that's something that they should have done on the ground before they took off. Yeah. And I think it was maybe the accident where they're all looking at, I think, the gear bulb light and crashed into the swamp, I believe, the Everglades, and what nobody was paying attention of the profile of the aircraft. Yeah, I'd much rather have get yelled at from the customer or client going, I'm 20 minutes late. Going, well, sir, we, we had a problem with the airplane and we had to do X, Y, or Z. And that all goes back to that pre-flight planning and, and limiting those distractions and putting certain things away, you know, and that might be turning off your email, Della, if you're a boss or you're a, a leader who has got a lot of busy work things outside of flying is transfer those duties, tell your staff going, I'm not going to be bothered from Thursday afternoon on until Sunday when I get back from my trip, give it to the number two guy or gal, because that stuff can wait. Yeah, I think part of it is to have the discipline to first develop standard operating procedures, but then just use them every single time. And yeah, don't take shortcuts because I think that's where people get in trouble. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So you had mentioned before something about BOLD. Tell us about the BOLD acronym. So BOLD is a little bit of play on our bold face or our media actions. So uh, the BOLD stands for what I like to talk about is bold face which is the B. So there's your emergency actions, your immediate actions. Then the O and the L are the operating limitations. So looking at, you know, temperatures, pressures, weight and balance, icing limitations, prop speeds, things like that, maybe runway length for takeoff and landing, understanding those. And then the D is decision-making because we can have all the knowledge of the temps, pressures, and the emergency actions. But if we don't make good and sound decisions when things don't go the way they've been planned or that we get a curveball, that decision-making is going to be critical to determine the outcome of that flight. So what I try to remind folks is, hey, be bold on the first of the month. And like I said, back in the military, we'd fill out our, our bold face, our immediate actions every month on the first of the month. And granted, if it fell on a Saturday or Sunday, we would do it on that next work day or if we were flying on the weekend. So folks sometimes didn't do that on the day one of the month, but the application would be, do your bold face, review your ops limits, review your decision making, and do that every month, maybe as a beginning cadence. And then once you get, and you can do it every day if you really want. We just did that every month. But as you kind of look at that triad of things with the immediate actions, the operating limitations, and really decision making, that can help you gain some more proficiency and awareness and understanding. And the decision making can be like, as you look at your plan for flying from let's say Sioux City to Dallas, Texas in January, probably going to have some icing to deal with. Might have some winds, might have some low ceilings. So not only are you current, but are you proficient to go fly an instrument approach to go land on maybe a not so dry runway. And sometimes that can be regional geographical. In Florida, it's probably thunderstorms in the summer. In New England, in October, November, there's probably a lot of low ceilings. And there might be some crosswinds as spring shows up. And so reviewing those decisions of what would I do if, now granted, there's infinite number of scenarios, but as you talk through it, talk through it with Flying Club, CFI, NAFI, some other organizations, special interest groups, whatever, what have you, AOPA, other things like that, you'll get to share those experiences and understandings because someone may have a better idea than you, or you may wind up mentoring someone who 
who just got into flying because there's a lot of freedom in flying, but there's, there's also a lot of risk. So the more that you take time to understand and be bold in your flying is really the, the kind of the foot stomper. So the B for bold face, I guess that refers to the memory items in the checklist. So the first ones that you should remember before you then have to execute the rest that you're not required to remember. That's right. Yep. Let's talk about uh, in-flight operations after we've finished all the pre-flight. Yeah. So in-flight, the fun stuff, right? Actually fly in the airplane. And we all know the flight review requirements. And if you're instrument rated, those requirements. And I would also say when you do your in-flight, what do you like to work on as the individual pilot? And, you know, one thing we had to do in the Air Force, flying helicopters and deploying a lot to desert countries was a, was a maneuver or a landing called a brownout. And it is where we take the helicopter and land in a sandy, dusty environment, usually in a foreign country, usually in combat. You could probably Google what a brownout looks like. And so imagine that there's not only sand, but very fine sand, almost like a talcum powder, baby powder kind of consistency. And as you fly a helicopter into that, it starts to kick up all that dust and creates a gigantic cloud. And that cloud obscures everyone's vision. And we have sensors and forward-looking infrared on the helicopter they used to fly to help us find that landing zone. And that was just a thing that we had to do based on what the military tasked us to do. And so for the longest time, we had really no currency for a brownout. Eventually, they added a currency event. So you had to go out and perform one. I think it was every 90 or 30 days. I can't remember off the top of my head. We knew that folks had to go do this. They had to be good at it. We would practice the brownout technique in the daytime to a hard surface, get the skills and the cadence and the calls with the crew kind of to an acceptable level, and then go find a moderate, not really crazy uh, level of brownout or obscuring vision and degraded visual environment. And we do that in the daytime. And then we would, re would repeat that process at night. So practice at night with goggles to a hard surface or runway or taxiway or helipad and kind of practice there and then go out at night in a, we used to call them brownout pits. Some places like Southern Georgia, where I was stationed quite often, they create a really good brownout pit and dug up the dirt. Other places like Southwest and Nevada and Arizona, it's all desert. And you could get into some really, really good training. And so we use those techniques, kind of stair-stepping and building block approach. So folks weren't, they weren't cocky or, com or complacent, they were confident. And that kind of fed into, we had a readiness program, certain things and maneuvers and events that we had to do, you know, air refueling, brownouts, instrument approaches. But I think the translation max for, for the general aviation pilot really is figure out what you want to work on as the pilot. You may not be good at holding. You may not be good at grass landings, short field takeoffs and landings. You may take off from a controlled field and go land on your buddy's uh, sod strip that's 2,000 feet. You haven't done that in a while. We gave some presentations at Oshkosh. How did folks prepare to come into Oshkosh? I've never done it. It looks fascinating and wild. Just reading the notum is intimidating to itself. And, you know, listen to the radio traffic over Fisk, Fisk, pardon me, and rip on and places like that. It's, it's pretty cool. So how do folks prepare to go do things like that? And getting a regular check, checkup, you know, flight reviews every 24 calendar months. Nothing says you can't do more of them. Now, there might be a financial burden to that, but it really depends on what, what you want to get better at. So it sounds like what you're telling folks is that they really should identify areas of weakness and develop their own program for keeping proficiency in that area. One that comes to mind immediately would be emergency landings, you know, without power. I still remember years ago giving a flight review to someone and I pulled the power and said, all right, now walk through the steps you're going to do with a failed engine. And he said, wow, I haven't done this for 10 years. And I just thought, holy cow, why wouldn't you? Here's a maneuver that could save your life. Why wouldn't you go out and uh, consciously practice it frequently. Yeah. And in fact, I was on a trip over the weekend and went into this one FBO where one of my students who's now flying corporate as well, we hadn't seen each other since, since his check ride. And we had a very similar issue. We had a 172 that wasn't producing enough power. We get back over the airfield and he enters the downwind and we heard this sound. The engine never stopped is the short story. We landed safely and everything's fine. But we both looked at each other going, did you do that? No, it wasn't me. And so he initiated the, um, you know, the power off descent 
But he's like, I always remembered that. And I said, yeah, I mean, we're doing commercial maneuvers for his check ride. And he had thought I'd set something up with the aircraft. I said, no, man, I, not me. I said, the aircraft's doing its own. So he, he did great. He executed the procedures, but he always remembered that. And that stuck with him, that experience. But yeah, after the check ride, there's no currency for things like that unless you develop it, or there's little currency or requirement for things like that. Yeah. And I think one should really want to develop pride in their ability to do those kinds of things. So definitely go out and practice those. So what do you mean when you say that people should build their own unit? Yeah. So in the military, we had a, um, a training officer. We had what we would call the weapons and tactics shop. So those were the the senior level instructors who really knew the aircraft or the helicopter. In my case, it was a helicopter. They were the, I'd say the higher level, the more expert level of uh, not only flying, but also employing that aircraft. And I think for a general aviation pilot, you know, who was in your unit? In the military, we'd have a chief pilot, folks that would do standardization, evaluation, give check rides. We'd have instructors and things like that. But for general aviation, who is on your kind of brain trust or your team? Who is your go-to person if you have questions? Is it your old flight instructor? Uh, do you have a chief pilot? Uh, let's say you fly a, a Cirrus or a 182 going, hey, I'm, I'm seeing this type of display. The aircraft's doing this. Who would you go talk to? Okay, a mechanic can do that. But another pilot who may be flying the same aircraft, doing the same mission, flying the same scenarios, you might be able to lean on them uh, for insight, advice, and guidance. I'd say also finding a mentor, someone who that, and it could be a local CFI, could be a flying club, somebody from an advocacy group, NAVI, AOPA, SAFE, things like that, might be a local FAST team member in your area. And those are easily found. I'm a FAST team member where I live. And some finding that that person, that team, that agency that can help you keep your skills sharp, you can go to with questions if there's a rule change, because sometimes rules are changing all the time, that you can go to to, to talk and have questions with. I, I have a network of folks, both on the fixed wing side and on the helicopter side. I'm like, hey, remember how we did this? Or I'm thinking about, does it work like that? They're like, no, we haven't done that in 10 years, Tom. Like, that's why I'm talking to you, because I don't fly many helicopters too much anymore. But if I know friends that do, and they're in different military things, contract and EMS. So if I have helicopter questions, I'll call them. If I have jet questions, I might call a different group of folks. So it's, it's your personal brain trust. It's folks that you can depend on when you have kind of those in-depth questions. And it can maybe also check your planning. I still have some students reach out to me if they're planning something like, hey, can you take a look at this cross country? And I said, okay, I'm not your instructor right now. I can't endorse you for anything. However, here are some things to think about. And that's both good and humbling because they're safety minded. They're concerned about what they're doing. Maybe looking at the winds, the weather, and that kind of ties back max to personal minimums and knowing themselves going, mm, I don't think I can go from the 6,000 foot paved surface to the 1,500 foot sod surface. I haven't landed on sod ever. Or boy, it's been a while. What do you think, Tom? I'm like, mm, let's walk through that. So that's kind of what I talk about building your unit. Yeah, definitely good to have knowledgeable people that you can reach out to for help. Now, one of the phrases that I didn't understand when I first heard about it was knock it off. Talk about that. What does that mean in the military and how does that apply to general aviation flying? Yeah. So in the Air Force and in all services, they have what's called TRs, training rules. And those training rules both exist for air to air. So when there's dog fights, helicopters did very little of this, mainly on the fighter side. They'd have air to air rule sets and then air to ground about, you know, certain engagements, spacing, distances, and um, phraseology. And the knock it off really is safety of flight. The aircraft is in an unsafe position, whether that's by itself, it's too low or too close to something in a helicopter because we got close to a lot of buildings, a lot of trees, a lot of other aircraft. And that knock it off was stop the maneuver, get safely separated away from the ground or from the other aircraft or the hazard. And that could be a building, a boat, another airplane, whatever. And that was basically that phraseology, that, that uh, directive phrase and s declarative statement that anybody could be the youngest airman on the aircraft to the oldest person flying. Anybody could call it. Everybody had that. But the knock it off is really good that if somebody saw something that was unsafe, sometimes even unprofessional, whether it was going to be a hazard to somebody in the aircraft, somebody outside the aircraft, they could call that. And it was, it was a way to stop, reset, and sometimes go home on a training mission. We also would have this term called terminate, which was, I, I guess, a lesser 
severity of knock it off. That was like, ah, our spacing's too close. If we're doing, you know, formation landings in a helicopter, let's try it again. Let's we debrief it and try it again so we could keep practicing. That's more like a, eh, let's stop and reassess. The knock it off was, nope, something bad's going to happen. So let's stop it before it does. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about situations that people might apply that in GA. For example, I used to go to a particular non-towered airport. And when we got that fourth person in the traffic pattern doing touch and goes, that's when we would leave the pattern because it was just getting a little too crowded, just a little too unsafe. Uh, another example might be uh, just last week, uh, we were doing an instrument approach uh, into uh, an airport and there was a, a 767 that was preceding us. And as I was calculating the height above us and the distance and the time to reach the point where he was, I could see, yeah, you know what? High probability of encountering wake turbulence. So we just requested a 360 on the practiced instrument approach. And I specifically said for wake turbulence, which was granted. So we just made a turn and I said to the gentleman, no, 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 make it a slow turn. We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to make this 360 quickly, you know, make it kind of standard rate. We want a good two minutes. So I think there are a lot of different situations that pilots can kind of envision ahead of time. You know, when are we kind of getting into a situation that makes us uncomfortable and, and where the margins of safety are, are really decreasing? And that's a good time to, to knock it off and do something else. Yeah. And, and I love your analogy about the wake turbulence and a great opportunity for that individual to just practice a nice holding pattern, right? And kind of check that, check that box. And I think the thing for general aviation pilots to, to see and comprehend is trying to, I don't want to say predict, but see when those conditions and the speed, the altitude, the vector, and what you're hearing and seeing outside the aircraft or on a display, when you've got the experience like you do or I do, or somebody who's been flying for quite some time, you go, mm, this is not going to get any better. Let's just knock it off and we'll go around. And that could be same thing, crosswind landings, uh, you know, speed and altitude or stuff like that. And there's so many different applications. But for the GA pot, they can develop those on their own. And that might tie right back to their standard operating procedures going, okay, if I get out there and we take off and I hit icing or I hit turbulence at this flight level or this altitude and I'm climbing 10,000 and I get really terrible indications at five, I'm going to knock it off and go back home or whatever. Now you had talked in the past about being brilliant at critical phases of flight. And there are certainly times when we're doing something in flight training as a flight instructor that I am absolutely on high alert because I recognize that is a more critical phase than, you know, flying level and cruise, for example, with the autopilot on. Talk a little bit more about critical phases of flight. Yeah. I was always taught to be brilliant at the basics and those critical phases of flight, you know, the takeoff landing, things like that. Because sometimes flying is really about patterns and flows. You know, we've got the sea gumps. I like to talk about aim point, airspeed alignment, but being brilliant at those bases because you, you, you got to do the takeoffs and you got to do the landings. Sometimes the en route stuff is less critical, but those critical phases of flight, making sure that your, your skills and your knowledge are ready to meet the abilities that are needed to go take that specific flight. And there's a number of different ways folks can do that. And when you're developing your own training program maxes, instead of maybe flying for that hundred dollar hamburger, maybe you just go practice 10 takeoffs and landings and you do different, maybe a short field or a soft field. Pretty sure you still have to do those on your private pilot check ride, right? But after the check ride, when's the last time you've done one? Because you never know when there might be some scenario where you think you're going to airport X and you wind up at airport Y for some other reason. And I think it's also managing that, that stress that you might find out when you haven't done practicing certain events. So it's really kind of that bring billion of the basics also tends to eliminate some complacency that some pilots may find. So there's some application there. So there's a lot of value in chair flying, something that I did a lot of in my early days when I couldn't afford to be out in the airplane quite as much. Talk about that and also about simulators. Yeah. Chair flying, when I was learning to fly in high school, ran out of money very quickly, blessed to go into the Air Force, I was exposed to what chair flying was. And the first time I saw chair flying was flying the T-37. They don't fly that anymore. The Tweet, uh, side-by-side -side jet trainer. And we had the big poster. So we're all in our dorms in pilot training. And we'd put the poster of the cockpit up in our room. And literally the stick was a plunger 
and my throttle, I think, was a sponge or something like that. So we would go through and practice, and that was my first introduction. And I think I think my classmates from the Air Force Academy really taught me what chair flying was because they were used to it and they were doing flying team and soaring and things like that. And you'd sit in your dorm, sometimes practicing your flows and checklists. But also, I like to talk to myself. And I think when folks go through checklists and they hear themselves, and this is all before the internet and recording and things like that. Now you can record yourself and watch all that stuff. But the chair flying kind of imprints that memory, imprints those items, and you hear yourself and you're getting your flows. And if you have a friend to watch you, which we did in pilot training, sometimes our Friday nights were we would chair fly and quiz each other and do things because we were living, eating, and breathing all day flying. And that's how we would learn, do the maneuvers and events. And that chair flyer, chair flying is, I think, powerful for a couple things, a couple reasons for the general aviation pilot is it gets them comfortable with what they're doing in the aircraft and they can see it in a well-lit, you know, 1G environment in their room or in their chair or whatever. If they have a poster and now we got simulators and you got commercial things where you can just put it on a laptop, put it on an iPad or whatever. And so you can display your cockpit. And so learning really has changed from books, volumes of books. You've got obviously interactive things with computers and simulators, but you can practice your basics. You can expand your skill set, and you might even be able to trap some of your own errors or watch or have someone watch you to trap your, uh, to see your errors. Simulators are very powerful because you can lower the the uh, minimums. If you're doing instruments, you can put in crosswinds, you can perfect that technique and that muscle memory. And then when you have to go and do it in the airplane, you've got that muscle memory. You've got some place to go back to in your memory and your skill and your knowledge and your experience so that you have a better flight when you actually have to go out and do it. Yeah. Chair flying to me is very similar to a study that I read about many years ago about a psychologist who took three groups of people and he had them all shoot baskets and they kept track of how many baskets they were able to shoot correctly. And then with the groups, they had different activities they would do over the, the following week. One group would practice shooting baskets. Another group did absolutely nothing. And the third group visualized shooting baskets uh, during that downtime. But then they brought them all back and they retested them. Not surprisingly, the people that practiced shooting did the best. The people who did no practice did more poorly. But surprisingly, the people who visualized it did almost as well as the people who actually went out there and practiced. And to me, that's the whole essence of chair flying. When we're mentally simulating uh, what it's like to fly the airplane, believe it or not, that's almost as good, not quite as good as uh, being out there practicing in the airplane. Right. And having friends to, you know, when I was with my pilot training classmates, we would say certain things and we would do these things called pattern walks because we had certain places in the, in the traffic pattern. We did a thing called an overhead pattern in pilot training where you couldn't do a certain maneuver. You couldn't go to the closed pattern if somebody had reported a certain distance out from the end of the runway. And so it allowed us to Basically, we were running our own simulator. We didn't know it at the time because we were just kind of dopey lieutenants trying to figure it all out. But we were able to simulate that decision making. And someone says, okay, so-and-so request closed. And somebody just reported three miles. Oop, can't do that. That's against the rules. And that's what we would do, not every night, but that was sometimes our Friday night. But we imprinted our memory and go, that way when it comes time to go do it in the airplane, we're like, yep, nope, can't do that because I learned and I've practiced. It's just like dress rehearsals if you're an actor, rough drafts if you're a writer, very similar to that concept. Super. Well, we've talked about pre-flight, in-flight. Talk a little bit about post-flight. Yeah. So this is where in the military, most of the learning would, would largely occur. I had an opportunity to go through the Air Force Weapons School, the Air Force version of Top Gun and go back and be an instructor. And, and we, we really took the debrief uh, seriously. It's where you kind of replay what happened, reflect on what went on, uh, what went good, bad, safety of flight, knock it off, things like that. And the good thing about the military is there was no rank in the room. So like I said, just like with the knock it off scenario, the youngest airman could tell me as the senior officer, they go, hey, go around. That wasn't good. Knock it off. They could also say in, in a most professional way, and I've been you know, professionally called out going, sir, that was a terrible approach. You're right. Yeah, you're right. It was, it was not good. And, but here's why. But we would we would collect our data. Sometimes we would have tapes that would record the uh, the sensors on board, the forward-looking infrared, so we could project 
Now you can do, you can do a lot of merging of information. You could see it on the maps where the helicopter was, the height, the speed, the angles, very advanced. And the, some of the more advanced aircrafts have different sensors and pods to capture all that data. But we would reflect on what happened, decide what we learned or a lesson that we might have reinforced, like, hey, we knew X, we reinforced it tonight. Then there was other things like there was points to ponder, like, hmm, I don't know why the uh, engine did that. Let's go back and look. It's not in the book. Let's go talk to the mechanics. But now for general aviation, boy, with the advent of devices like iPads and ForeFlight and uh, GoPros and linking all that technology, you can really, you can really make a powerful debriefing application. And they really amplify and imprint that learning of playing it back, freezing it, going, what were you? And it's great for instructors. It's great for companies as well. And using that to basically hold yourself accountable and owning your mistakes. Because, and I think that's really the part, the part of the debrief is, yep, I made a mistake. And in some of the units I was in, we would like to say, if you were to go out and do this flight over again tomorrow after afternoon or at night, what would you do differently? There's always going to be something you can learn. And I, maybe it was an instructor and I'm not sure who coined this, but the day you probably stop learning about flying is probably the day you should stop flying. But that post-flight is really somewhat of a direct connection to how you did the planning. And that's where we start. Did we have all the information that we needed? Did we have all the materials and tools and information resources? How did we execute it? We walked out the door thinking we were going to do A, but we wound up doing B. Why did that happen? What can we do to change that? And sometimes that's not a bad thing. Sometimes, oh, we didn't realize this. So let's add that to our standard operating procedure. Let's add that to our experience or our tactics jar and really replay those things back, reflect on the good and the bad, and sometimes the ugly. You know, we would always talk about the knock it offs first because that's the safety of flight kind of things. And then remember, because sometimes in our training environment in the military, much like general aviation, your training flights might be very similar to each other. And you're building that skill set, you're building that, that muscle memory, you're building that acumen and that proficiency, not only currency up. And I'd say the last thing is I'm a big believer in writing down lessons learned, almost journaling, keeping a diary. And I still have mine from pilot training. It's sitting right over there. And I found it the other day. And, you know, I remember who, who had the emergency procedure that day, the, the stand up, the, uh, the first of the day and all that stuff and how you learn. And that's how, that's how I was taught. So I think there's some application for general aviation pilots. Is that easy? No, but you know, there's things like iPhones and you can do voice recordings and here's what I learned on my flight today. And then when you go back and you connect the dots and you build that database of learning, it's quite powerful. I'm really glad you brought up the journaling because I was going to mention that I've had clients who would write down a page of information after a particular flight. And I have done that particularly with my helicopter training, which I started earlier this year. And I've got copious notes from every single flight because I found that, yes, I may have heard it once in the helicopter, but boy, I'm not going to remember everything that I heard in the helicopter because it's a, it's a lousy classroom, which is partially why I also would record at least the audio from the flights. But it's really helpful to then go back weeks and you know, months later and just kind of review all that and find out, oh yeah, I really should remember to do this, that, or the other. So I really strongly encourage people to do that. Now you had mentioned something about good, better, best. Tell us about that. Yeah. I personally like to deal in things of three because they're easy for me. You know, you get to four and five and like, it gets kind of cloudy. So three things. And I had an instructor tell me, he goes, what were you good at? Okay, good. So let's say it's, boy, the takeoff was really great. Great centerline discipline, good power control, good crosswind inputs, whatever. You were good at that. You got better at your holding. Your entry was good. Your timing was good. Your slowdowns were good. Your configuration was good if you do that sort of thing in the airplane. And your best was really the ILS. And so maybe as we go through these training iterations, I would recommend folks going, okay, your approach was good, was that was the best. So maybe less focus on that. You got better at your holding. So maybe we'll put a little bit more attention on that. And you were good at your takeoff, but I really need you to be your best 
on the takeoff because if you're going to go fly instruments, it's probably going to be some crosswinds. And that way, it was, it was a way to kind of categorize what the individual or what the student had to focus on. Another way to look at this, Max, is what are you going to start? I'm going to start getting better at takeoffs in our analogy, crosswind controls. I'm going to stop, maybe not stop, but a little less emphasis on whatever you're doing really well at. And then I'm going to really continue on, yeah, continue flying the ILS and the needles and the cross-check management as you, as you would. And so, way just a simple way to categorize what student pilots and even what all the pilots can focus on. And I think with that, it ties into sometimes easier said than done, but I have this theory of the training ratio theory, flying versus ground. If you're flying for an hour, if you're a student pilot, and some of us are all students, I know I am at some level or another, for every hour that you're flying, if you can study, review, reflect, or even remember for an hour, that'd be great. Is that always possible? I no. We It's... Unless you're a full-time student of aviation in a university or a training program, that may not be possible. But you can set a goal for yourself to say, okay, I I just did a three-hour flight. I'm going to prepare myself for an hour. Uh, I'm going to do some pre-flight study, and then I'm going to spend 45 minutes on the backside reflecting on what went right, what went wrong, what could I do better. And I think it's really that accountability to yourself as the pilot in command, but also to the people that you're carrying as well and protecting them. And I think it's good to think about ratios of the ground study time versus flight time. And I'd suggest that it probably varies depending upon the flight and the stage of learning that you're in. For example, if you're a proficient pilot and you just made a cross-country flight to someplace, well, maybe the hour of study is it's going to be less than, than that ratio. But <laughs> I'm thinking back to me earlier in the year learning helicopters. I can assure you it was a heck of a lot more than one hour of study for every hour of flight. And I think anyone who is working on a new rating really ought to think about that in terms of just being the minimum amount of ground study that you should be doing when you're working on a new rating. No, I, I agree. And, and, you know, reflecting back to Oshkosh, never flown in there, read through the, I think the NOTAM's 40 pages. It's dense. So how did they prepare going in there the first time? Maybe they watched some videos. Maybe they talked to a buddy. And those, so there's some prep time. Yeah, I totally agree with your with your helicopter analogy. I remember looking in the cockpit of, a, of an HH-60 Blackhawk as I got out of flying Hueys. And we do it a little bit differently now in the Air Force, but I'm looking at it like, man, look at all those switches and dials. And holy, I'm never going to figure this out. And then 3,000 hours later, I'm like, yep, I love it. I'm not saying I'm an expert by, by no stretch of the matter measure, but, um, it, but it does take time. And it's really just, it's coming up with a plan and being diligent at your planning. And I think the goal for any pilot is mastery of the aircraft. And that involves knowing every single one of those switches and what they do. So Tom, as we start to wrap up here, any uh, final thoughts? I'll just kind of hit my highlights is that know yourself, know your capabilities, know your aircraft. And if you fly multiple, know your different airframes, build a team. That could be your local CFI, could be your buddy who owns the airplane with you, could be your flying club, wherever. Make your own readiness program. Know what you're not good at, where you want to improve. Debrief, debrief, debrief. Learn from your your goods, your bads, and your not so goods. Protect your investment and really and just enjoy flying. I mean, there's just so many opportunities out there and we're just blessed to have a wonderful supportive community across the country to go to go and do flying and enjoy that freedom uh, wherever we need to go. So thanks again, Max. No question. Flying is one heck of a lot of fun. Tom, thanks so much for joining us here today. Max, I appreciate it. Thanks very much. And my thanks to Tom Doral for joining us here today. And just a reminder that I love hearing from you and I read many of your emails on the show. If you'd like to send me a message, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page. That's absolutely the best way to send me a message. And of course, I also want to thank everyone who supports the show in one of the following ways. We love it when you join the club and sign up at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. To support the show financially, you can also do that at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. We also love it when you leave a five-star review on whatever app that you're listening to us on now. But most importantly, please tell one or more of your friends about the show. That's the primary way that we grow the show. So please let your friends know about Aviation News Talk. And of course, if you're in the market for a headset, please consider buying a Lightspeed headset and using one of the links in our show notes, because if you use those links, they will donate to help support the show. 
So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You.